um, we'll record the webinar today and anyone who has registered will receive an email with the link to view back the recording at a later date, um, but also access to the slides. So if there's anything in here you want to look back at, you'll be able to do that. Um, and with that, I will get started. I'm going to talk a bit today about how you can get credit and recognition for method development. Here we go. So the focus of the presentation is about incentives for sharing experimental methods in protocols or in any other outlet or repository. But some very quick housekeeping here. As I mentioned just now, we're recording the webinar. There should be time for Q&A at the end of the webinar, but if you have questions as I go through, feel free to add them in the Q&A, uh, ideally in the Q&A, but also in the chat if there's something that comes up during the webinar as they occur to you. If I spot them, I may stop and answer them. If not, I will get to them at the end. And um, also just a reminder that we often offer other webinars. This one's quite focused on publishing and research outputs. If you wanted more of a general introduction or advanced features functionality, take a look at the webinars page uh, because you'll be able to sign up for other webinars um, at a time that suits you. We do, my, I tend to give them on kind of Euro and African friendly time zones this time of day, uh, but we have uh, colleagues in America who try to accommodate other time zones. So we do different times through the month each month. And here is a little brief overview of the things I'll cover today, looking at how methods publishing and availability has changed in the 21st century. Uh, but then on to how public sharing and getting credit for reproducible and discoverable protocols is something that you can do using protocols.io. Um, and also just how you can then use the protocols in protocols.io to improve the reliability and impact of your research papers with some really nice feedback from authors who have done exactly that. Uh, so you can get not just my word for it as someone with a conflict of interest who represents protocols.io, but actually how this has been impactful for researchers within the context of their career. So we'll get started looking at what's happened with methods publishing in recent times. So we go back just a little bit in history. <clears throat> Nature Methods, the journal, was pretty much the first methods only journal that launched in 2004. So not really that long ago. Uh, and the excerpt that you can see here is from the inaugural editorial that was published in this journal. So the founding editors stated that their goal was to create a highly visible forum for the presentation of novel methods because major methodological developments take their roots in the cross fertilization of different disciplines. As a contrast to this, the normal way of communicating methods in the methods section of any other journal or article they are somewhat useful for targeted peer groups, but they generally don't give technical information the wide exposure needed to move towards those interdisciplinary exchanges. Uh, and I've got some great examples, or a great example of an interdisciplinary success story via methods a little bit later, but behind the scenes, still thinking about nature methods, we learned from the founding editor-in-chief um, of Nature Methods, Veronique Kierma, uh, she later became and is still the chief scientific officer at the Public Library of Science. She told us that when they looked to found Nature Methods and launch that journal, there was a lot of skepticism even in Nature Publishing Group around that launch because they thought that researchers published research and that was what they did. That was their bread and butter at that publishing uh, operation and thought that nobody would read or be interested in just, just methods on their own. And they were concerned that a methods only journal might dilute their brand uh, and it would be really hard to fill a journal's pages with content that was just methods and so on. So, but as we all know, Nature Methods was and is still a huge thriving success. It is very interesting though to think that, you know, less than 20 years ago, there was a lot of skepticism about whether methods merited independent credit um, in and of themselves. We actually have a really nice podcast interview with Veronique. Uh, when you access the slides later, you can go and listen to that if you want. But if you Google it, I'm sure you'd find it too. And lots has happened since then. So if we think about the last 10 years, 
there's a lot more methods focused journals that have been um, launched within the entire research discipline. So I've got some examples shown on this slide, but it's definitely not exhaustive. And big publishers like Springer Nature uh, continue to expand this portfolio of method centered journals. It, so they had Nature Protocols two years after they launched Nature Methods, but now they also have Protocol Exchange, Osevier launched Star Protocols and Methods X, and there's lots of other independent initiatives like Jove, Babilio, um, Journal, and Bio Protocols and others. So we're now in a place where journals, funders, and a lot of researchers realize that it's not just code and data that we should be sharing. Uh, it was kind of, I guess, late 90s and noughties when we started to move away from data available upon request or code um, towards starting to make use of specialized repositories for data and code, things like GitHub and Dryad, Figshare and Open Science Framework. These have all emerged in recent times that um, are being have been embraced by the community as a brilliant way to share research outputs. Data availability statements started to be commonplace in a lot of journals really after the PLOS policy was implemented in 2014. Uh, but methods are still playing catch up. We do have these journals now, but um, sharing them is starting to be the norm, but there's definitely still work to be done. Uh, another shift, and it's a bit of a tangent, is thinking about um, registered reports. Many of you may not have heard about them, but this is an interesting shift in the way uh, research is being performed and acknowledged and credited with the, the value of the methods and protocols themselves being the key component of a registered report. So a timeline, this is just a different kind of research publishing process, and I'll quickly explain it to you, but I won't spend too long here. Timeline shows here they were really first conceived only in 2012, that in that very short time period, in up until 2019, they were already implemented in over 200 journals, including very um, high profile, well considered journals like PLOS Biology that cover a lot of research disciplines. Um, I'm sure that number is a lot higher now too. So if you haven't come across them before, I'm gonna quickly explain what a registered report is. So there are two stages that are submitted separately. <clears throat> The first stage is a proposal of what the authors plan to investigate and what approach they're going to take to investigate that research question. So this first stage includes a fully fleshed out study design and proposal. And it's the proposal of the research question and how they will probe and try to answer that re research question that is submitted and reviewed in that very first stage. If a journal considers the studies relevant and agrees that proposed methodology is appropriate, powered correctly, uses the right techniques, etc., then the study will receive an in principle acceptance. So that means the authors have the go ahead to go off, perform the actual study, do the research, collect any data, analyze and interpret. And this is what they then write up as the stage two report and resubmit back to the journal. But um, having had that in principle acceptance of the stage one submissions, that means that they have a pre-approved acceptance for this stage two version, as long as they more or less follow what was proposed in the submission that they submitted at stage one. They can make some changes to the approach, but they will need to be tracked and accounted for with just justification of why changes were made. But if everything checks out at stage two, the submissions reviewed and the journal will publish the article. It is pretty cool because this means that registered reports are a publishing format that emphasizes the importance of the research question and critically the quality of the methodology, because that's what's peer reviewed before the study is actually carried out and the data collected and analyzed. So you remove any issues of researchers trying to prove a hypothesis as the study is accepted regardless of the outcome. So if you don't get the exciting result, you just get something eh, a bit meh after you actually perform the research, it will still be published regardless. So it's not, it loses that kind of sensationalization that may be a problem in publishing. And it's high quality protocols and the method itself that's provisionally accepted so uh, protocols.io can be a brilliant place 
to actually put those, <laughs> not least because we have the versioning option. So if you have a version on protocols.io that's accepted in, as a part of the stage one, but you do make some changes, you'll be able to make a new version for submission with stage two and it, all of the changes that you make will be tracked. So it's a fantastic way uh, to also submit registered report protocols. Okay, so that's enough of kind of the changes that we've had in recent times. I'll go on to talk about public sharing and getting credit for reproducible and discoverable protocols on protocols.io. So I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but there's a lot of different research outputs that we've been accommodating the sharing of for some time. So the most well recognized here at the center is the paper. So this is the bread and butter tends to be the currency that you'll be putting on your CVs and that funders and your employers will be looking for as an output from you. But we have become much better at appreciating also the value of code and data um, and making sure that those are shared and citations are also an important element. Uh, but last but not least, absolutely not least, is the methods. In fact, methods are really the linchpin to reuse um, and the ongoing value of all of these other items hinges on having the method because it's really hard to understand what the data mean if you don't know how they were generated. So let me illustrate that with um, some nice cookies or well, everything's virtual still a lot of the time. So I can't give you all cookies, but I can just taunt you with a nice photo of some cookies. So this is an image that um, I found in an article where someone had made all of these cookies simply by making tiny tweaks to the same recipe. Follow one recipe, but change one little thing each time. You can see that if the cookies are the data and the results that were generated after performing an experiment, the experiment here just being that recipe, um, they're phenotypically very different. So all of your results here, the data are different phenotypically from one another. But scientifically, we can only really understand how those phenotypic differences came about if we have a knowledge as well of what the method tweaks were that we used to generate each diff different kind of cookie. So you have to know the recipe tweak for each cookie. So that just essentially is that the method is needed always to properly be able to interpret and understand the data that are generated, especially after some time has passed and maybe just knowledge that may you may just think oh I know how I generated those data that's fine uh, that knowledge gets lost over time degrades memories fail people don't quite remember etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and this is where protocols.io comes in so we are an online repository and platform for authors to share, develop, optimize protocols. And our mission is really, really simple. We want to make it easy to share method details before, during, and after publication. If you are not familiar with protocols.io at all, the URL on the bottom right here, protocols.io slash welcome, is a great place to start. We'll bring you to the homepage. It looks like this. Uh, and a lot of people, I think, know that protocols.io is an open access repository. So there are over 14,000 published protocols on protocols.io uh, and they are all published with this CC by fully open access license. It's incredibly versatile, you can use it across all different research disciplines and it's a very collaborative tool. What's perhaps less known is that there are loads of users who are using protocols.io to develop their content privately, shared within teams, groups, collaborations, projects, etc. So there's over 55,000 protocols that are private on the platform right now. Um, and that's really the business model of protocols.io. It is free for anyone to come and make an account. They can have a limited number of five private protocols right now and can publish those for free. So you can come in and use it freely with the premise that we want you to share. It's very much mission focused on also trying to increase open research. If you want more private content, that's what is then paid for. It's very much like GitHub model, if anyone is familiar with that. But so we have universities that take out um, licenses that provide unlimited access for researchers, 
it's not expensive in the grand scheme of uh, publishing open access papers, for example, but it does have a fee that means that we can provide better support too for those researchers. That's a bit of an aside, but just to explain, you know, the business model behind um, the offering. Any of you can sign up for free from this page for an account and start making protocols and publish them, publishing them. For the published protocols, <clears throat> that 14,000 just over now, um, every year about a million people come to the repository to read and, and access those published protocols. So it does bring a lot of visibility to your content, to your research content. They are not always tied to um, a corresponding research article. They just sit on protocols.io, but they are discoverable independently via search engines or in places where they're indexed like Crossref or Google Scholar. And if you want them to, they will appear on your ORCID ID profile if you have one as a published work on that profile. So they are already a really useful and valuable research outfit that can allow for researchers to receive credit for them. About 60% of all of our traffic comes from Google searches. People are just looking, kind of looking up a term, a research term, and they find a protocol on protocols.io. I think about 30% of the traffic is from the US and the rest is geographically probably equivalent about 30 from Europe or so. And then the rest is geographically distributed all around the world. So globally, very impactful, actually. Um, when you come into protocols.io, you can also search all of that public content on the platform from that home page where we were before. There's a search button, search location at the top. Um, and it'll bring you to an advanced search. So for ease of um, example, I just popped in PCR and you can access publications. So the protocols that have been made public and you can scroll through and see, you can see the metrics of how many other people have looked at those um, and access them. But you can also look for things like workspaces. Uh, we have groups set up as very public workspaces. So this was a coronavirus method development community that we set up. Anyone can join. If you go to the URL for this, um, sorry, jumping around, you'll be able to join that workspace and, and interact and start sharing and using that space for papers, for publications and protocols. But you can also look here at the members and the publications that they have, access resources, discussions and things that the researchers in that community have had with one another. And if you find interesting content and protocols, what is brilliant is that you can then run them yourself. If it's something that you're going to exactly replicate Josh Quick's protocol here, you can just access that protocol, run it in your lab, and it will give you um, a way to step through all of the steps of that protocol. If you have slightly different equipment or you want to change that, here, this was for uh, coronavirus. Maybe you want to apply it to a different virus. You can make a fork um, and then make the changes in your own copy. The fork is your, a copy for you, but which shows you the lineage. It will look like that. You'll see that it's been forked from an, uh, another protocol previously. Um, but then you can change it, edit it for the version that will work for you uh, and use that for your own research. And I mentioned earlier that I had a great example of interdisciplinary connections that could be made by sharing methods independently from researchers. So what we I'm showing here is at the top left, um, a tweet from a researcher in Chile who was looking for someone with experience doing RNA extraction from primary cortical neuron cultures. After a few tweets, um, <clears throat> Eleanor, a postdoc at UCSF, pointed to a protocol that was on protocols.io. When we looked more closely at that protocol, it turns out that it came from or was linked to from a paper published in GigaScience that was looking at a three-spine stickleback parasite, which is a fish parasite. So it is very, very unlikely that these um, researchers looking at research on brain cells, brain cultures, would have found this paper if this was the only place where that method was available. They were unlikely to happen upon a paper about a fish parasite as a likely source of the method that would be useful for them. So the fact of pulling the method out as a completely independent research output 
means that it's discoverable by so many more researchers than those who would not look at the paper that that method was actually alluded to in. So there's a ton of benefits really um, and can just increase the discoverability of your research, the methods themselves. Obviously is really great for reproducibility, facilitates these amazing disparate research connections between people working on completely different things um, facilitating the reuse as well of your methods and credit for you. Um, and so we actually we have a really nice resource, which is a protocol <laughs> on protocols.io, which helps you um, look and can give you a bit of an insight into try to how to make your protocol more reproducible, discoverable and user friendly. So uh, it runs through adding information, um, the abstract title, um, and a thumbnail picture. You can share to multiple different groups. So I showed you some of those public groups. You can put your protocol into one of those groups if you want. Add keywords, which means they can be discovered when you share more. Um, and there are lots of tips about how to make them more reproducible, the level of detail and information, the components, variables, wet lab, things like reagents and so on that you can include in there to improve them. It also add bioinformatics information. It's, as I said, it's very versatile across different research disciplines. You wouldn't necessarily be able to put short videos of techniques into a research paper, but you can put them into your protocols on protocols.io. Also make sure they're runnable. As I mentioned, people can come along and run your protocols. Uh, and it, we suggest single step instructions, making it much more instructive rather than a passive what would be in a narrative pass uh, a narrative piece of text in a paper um concise is helpful and add timings there's a timer when someone runs so they can run it in um actually directly run the timer in the protocol and you can add subsections which allow you to pull out separate parts of the different experiments and so on um, there's a link to this in the slides so again you'll have access later you can come and have a look if you want to and that will carry on um and we've got some lovely examples from researchers who've made a lot of use of protocols.io reporting that the sharing and publishing detailed protocols has directly led to an increase in the number of collaborations that they've established as other researchers have found them through their published content on protocols.io or the workspaces that they belong to. Uh, and it's important also to note before we go on to think about um, how protocols.io interacts with publishers, that since we launched in 2014, and with those over 14,000 published protocols, we've never seen an instance where putting a protocol and making it public on protocols.io has been problematic for a research article submission to a journal. Um, they are considered like preprints, so where that has become commonplace, the sharing of the method has not ever been something that has led a journal to say we will not consider your manuscript. Um, it's not deemed like a prior publication at all. So we would always encourage that you users share publicly whenever protocols are ready rather than waiting. Um, and from the publisher's perspective, sharing the protocol on protocols.io gives that research and the method additional visibility, but it also means the research that they're publishing in the journal is more likely to be reproducible. Um, and of course, it's a central place where you can iterate and share corrections and optimizations easily. If you've published a protocol on protocols.io, you can easily make a new version which will be linked to the one that was published when you published the research paper. So if you further want to clarify how to do something or you notice a mistake, you have the control to update that um, without needing to go back to the publisher, the journal. That's something that you'll be able to do very easily yourself. Um, so definitely doesn't preclude further publication. And uh, that takes me to the next bullet point on the agenda to demonstrate how you can improve the reliability and impact of your research papers by either including a call out to your protocols on protocols.io or by taking protocols themselves 
uh, that you've not really published before and turning the, the methods into peer-reviewed methods papers. Um, so first, a very quick overview of just how easy it is to publish a protocol on protocols.io. At the click of the publish button, you will enter this six step process where some information might be required from you. You won't be able to proceed without adding an abstract, etc. There are a minimum number of fields that you have to complete uh, before we will publish. If you're somewhere at the end of the confirmation, you'll do, you need to make sure your co-authors know and agree with this publication too, in the same way you would a research paper. Um, and once you go through those final confirmations, if you're somewhere with a license, it will immediately be published. If you're somewhere with just one of the basic free accounts, it will enter a fairly quick screening process. So we do screen before we let those be published, purely so that we can make sure that spam content doesn't get added to the site. Spammers have found us <laughs> um, and we do not want to be publishing many protocols about CBD gummies. So we don't let those ones go through. We tell you it takes about two days, but actually generally they're approved, um, screened and approved the same day and you'll receive an email to let you know it's been published outside of weekends and holidays, obviously. Um, pretty much always otherwise happens same day. Um, I'm showing reserved DOI here too. If you are a little bit hesitant about publishing and making a protocol immediately publicly available, we do have this option to reserve DOI. You will follow almost exactly the same process and you will be told what the DOI will be for your protocol. So you can put that into your manuscript, but you will also be issued with a private link that you can share with editors and reviewers so they can assess the protocol, but you won't have made it completely fully publicly available at that point in time. We would always recommend fully published because there's nothing more to be done. If you reserve DOI, you will have to come back later and complete the publish process by clicking publish and just seeing through the confirmations again and making it publicly available. Um, and how does that look in a published paper? So this is a POS biology published paper that has in the materials and methods, methods and protocols for all of the various experiments are available as a collection in protocols.io. And then you see the link, DOI link. Uh, if you click that DOI link, it will bring you to that collection that was published at the time the paper was published. And I mentioned earlier that you can make versions if there is a newer version of that collection, because at least one of those protocols has been updated with a newer version, you will immediately be told that there's a newer version of that collection available. And do you want to see the newer version? So presumably people generally do. Uh, and this is what I mentioned. This dynamic permanence means that authors can know that this Ex this version exists that was published at the time of publication, but they can come in and make those updates themselves, avoiding having to go back to the publisher if you want. And you can do this at many, many, many different journals. They are quite happy for you to link out to protocols.io. This uh, now is lab protocols in plus one. Uh, this is a much more tied in relationship that we have. They launched a new article type called lab protocol there is a requirement that the methods will be on protocols.io and the two things are bi-directionally linked. So I'll just show you, there's a short um, overview here of how that looks too. Um, and if, if you are interested in getting protocols peer reviewed and published as a protocol, article, you don't have to do it with PLOS One, you can use all those other, and there are other specialized journals, but this is one really great option. And PLOS One is very broad, allows for many different types of research. You can see how they're bi-directionally linked here with the little movie running. Um, <clears throat> they, the way that they've defined the scope is that they're not expecting new experimental results. They welcome new protocols. They might be extensions of something that's already been published or reported. Um, and the idea is that if you published already a method or someone else did it, but your work has been to troubleshoot or optimize a previous version, for example, new conditions or how to apply to something different, but a different organ or cell type, et cetera, that this work of optimization or tweaking can be recognized. 
that uh, things that researchers who develop methods can get credit. It might be that a student spends a really long time developing, optimizing a method, uh, but they never get to apply it specifically to something really exciting and new in terms of research data. This means they can get credit for that work on the method itself. And it sometimes turns out that author list of the people who develop the method would have a very different order than the author list on the research article where they've generated more data. So that allows you to see who the person was that did this work. So the lab articles mean you can get credit, um, not only for developing a whole brand new method, but also just for optimizing or troubleshooting protocols to make them work more efficiently or in new conditions. Uh, and the bar's set in a way that it recognizes good and useful protocols, but there should, of course, be some effort behind it. But the idea is to capture that constant method development that very often goes unacknowledged and is usually just summarized in a statement in a sentence or two in the materials and methods section of uh, a manuscript. And we've had some lovely feedback from authors of some of these lab protocols papers that I'm showing here. Monica at the top. Um, notes that because her wastewater, SARS coronavirus wastewater paper and protocol was picked up and had a lot of media coverage, including in the New York Times, she noted that it made her famous within her small Latin American country. Jacopo, I will show a bit more from him in a moment. He published that first lab protocol that I showed in the example previously, uh, and he was so excited. It was his first solo peer Peer review paper ever while still a PhD student. Um, and third here as Simon, this was his first paper as a senior author. So again, these are things that were pretty meaningful for them and their careers. Um, I'm just realizing now that when I shared, I don't think I put audio to come through. So I'm, I'm just going to jump out of the share for a second um, and then share again because I think I can select to share sound. And that is what I want to do. Oh, sec. Is it? Sorry, this is playing around with the screen at the time is always a bit tricky. Hopefully you see that again now. Um, oh, one second, hold on. Let me, I apologize. Bear with me just for one more second. Just want to get that out of full screen so I can do the. Right. I've lost my Zoom. It will be worth it, I promise, because uh, there's a really nice video um, of Jacopo um, um, we have done videos of authors of some of these lab protocols and he's made this lovely video so he'll talk Hindsight. about how it's impactful for um, his career. Now that you've started the postdoc um, when you look back in terms of the significance of the lab protocol for your career development and just looking back you know hopefully you're not regretting um doing this like how do you feel it fit into your phd and into the postdoc transition and the reception of the lab protocol paper um from your perspective? I'm, I'm, I'm extremely proud of it uh one of the things i'm really happy about is that of course it aided me in the completion um, of my PhD and me getting a PhD. It's one of the things that in my specific case, my PhD reviewers were really happy about and were really impressed by. So that's a point of honor for myself. But at the same time, I'm really happy of having it done for my own personal PhD because it sort of gave a methodological section to it. While especially in anthropology is usually research project uh, centered so a context a time period a culture being able to also develop a method and including a more technical aspect to it i thought it complemented that really well 
And although my PhD was specific to a time period and a region, I managed to add this methodological aspect that sort of went past those boundaries. Uh, another really uh, good thing that I think this protocol has done for my career is the recognition it gave me. As Lenny, you were saying, at first it kind of blew up. Uh, many people started following along and were interested and got in touch with me. I was lucky enough to have been invited to lectures and practical sessions at various universities. And for just a standard, uh, quite niche archaeological method, I think the article right now after a year has four citations in it and I've heard of people that are putting together the manuscripts and they've been using it as well. And that's something that I'm, I'm very proud of. And I think it has helped my career quite a lot. Let me stop video back on. So you can see for him, it was hugely impactful to share this. And it's a nice example too, because it's not wet lab research. It's very much a visualization method um, that he had put together. <clears throat> and he was really excited, tweeted all about this. It was a fantastic first um, protocol, lab protocol paper to have been published. But the, yeah, the spotlights are really nice for each of these. I can share um, later the link to the, there's a workspace for just those with the spotlights. Um, and they're well worth watching actually to get an insight into that process if you're interested in thinking about submitting a paper to lab to PLOS One as a lab protocol. Oops, do jump again. Uh, and as Hi. I said earlier, many, many, many journals are very happy for you to use protocols.io. So although we have that really nice relationship with PLOS One, uh, over 500 journals will state somewhere in their author instructions that they're very happy for you to share links to protocols on protocols that are actively encouraging that because it increases reproducibility and just makes for much more comprehensive detailing of the methods in those papers. And these are some really nice examples um, of papers that have been published where authors have linked to protocols.io but they also maybe have added links out to data or code or other things in really nice open research examples and just showing a variety of different journals where that's fully accepted and encouraged and the journals are happy to tweet about them as well and just to show that in in terms of getting credit for them you can track i can see there was a question about impact factor in the future we do not anticipate getting an impact factor. We're not a replacement for a publishing journal. We do, however, have citations for protocols. So once you've published your protocol, you'll look under metadata and you can download the citation. Or if you're using someone else's protocol, you can look at metadata there and download the citation for their protocol. And they can be imported into reference management software like Mendeley, EndNote, so you can use them and cite them in the reference sections of research papers. Um, but they generally don't. Um, well, it's not something that we anticipate at all to get an impact factor. We're not a journal in that way because it's much more preprint like really than a journal. Um, so it's a different thing. And there are many arguments about the value or lack thereof of impact factors and their utility in assessing quality of journals independently. So it's not something that we would be striving ever to get either anyway. Um, but yeah, when you've published the protocol, we do give a protocol citation. You can also add in the manuscript citation, or we can add that later if it's not published yet, or you can add that later if it's not published yet. And we always suggest that, you know, you remember to cite the publication along with the protocol. Obviously depends on context. If you were the brain cell researchers who used that RNA extraction protocol, it would be much more um, suitable to cite just the protocol rather than the paper on fish parasites for example. So it does depend on the context. But if you're reusing a method and also looking and reinterpreting the, the kind of approach and the data and results from another paper, then obviously citing both would be better. All of the content on the platform 
is archived, mirrored, um, and preserved as as rigorously, if not more, actually, than journal published journal content. Um, we also have archiving of the dynamic content, the comments, and the forking and versioning that happens with uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, who've invested quite a lot in making us really open research friendly. So the Citable, there are all the public groups you can look into um, and use those to organize and discuss content, find colleagues, communicate with other researchers who you might not have access to otherwise and find those new exciting collaborations by just discussing methods with the researchers who are sharing the content. Um, I mentioned the forking, people can do the versioning. There's also, I didn't show, but the ability to comment on published um, protocols as well. So if a protocol is reused a lot, then those comments become uh, like a public FAQ on the protocol, if you will. And the authors only need to answer questions once there. If they're public, they don't need to have to keep fielding by email over and over again. And the dynamic permanence is that ability to link from the papers to the protocols, but then subsequently update the protocols if you want to. It's really easy to track metrics, citations and reuse. So in terms of credit, there can be some really informative information. So this is a protocol that's been published, has a paper it's been cited in. So you can see any other citations, they'll show up here. But it's also had nearly, well, over 250,000 views, over 4,000 exports. You can see the reuse. 176 different forks so other users have come in and made their own copy of this 176 times uh, and with the forks you can also visualize those on the protocol too so you can see the versions and the public forks that have been made of those protocols it's a lovely way to see the reuse as a way of having and getting more credit for the value of the, the protocol itself and, you know, some people might be thinking, well, I can just put my protocol in a supporting information file. <laughs> um, that is not as valuable at all. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why, but ultimately not all publishers actually archive the supporting information files. They're not very well preserved. They're also not findable and discoverable. So if you're Googling around, you're not going to be searching the text within a supporting information file. So. If you have it as a PDF, talk to us about how you can get it into protocols.io because there are nice ways to do that as well. Uh, this is a nice article in The Scientist that talks a bit about why supporting information files are not necessarily the best way to go and that repositories are better, both for data and also for methods and so on and code. So many, many benefits of using protocols.io for publishing and linking methods to research articles. So the key one here is that you can get credit. As I said too, the author lists might be different. This means that people working on the methods are actually able to get credit for the methods that they develop. Um, and so with that, that's the last slide. I'll pop on to Q&A. I did notice a couple in there in addition to the one I already answered. So we'll smooch, switch that one across and I'll have a quick look, but feel free to add other questions to either the Q&A or the chat box and I will go through them now. Uh, if you have follow up questions later, feel free to email me. My email is there. Um, in the Open.io protocol team, would you recommend a biobank for genetically modified cells? Um, that is not really something that would be in our remit to make those kinds of recommendations, but I'm certain that you could find resources online if you look for them. Uh, you might even find someone's written a protocol about it if you searched on protocols.io, but no, that would be outside of our remit. So we provide the infrastructure, um, but we're not telling people or recommending other repositories for specific kinds of data or output and so on, um, hopefully. That, well, that doesn't really answer your question, but it just it's not something that we would um, be able to advise on particularly. Is it copy paste the text directly in the corresponding field? You can use, I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question, so feel free to come back and clarify, but you can copy paste text into different fields. So if you've got um, 
a protocol or some text that you want to put in like abstract material you should be able to copy paste things in i'm not sure if i've really answered that question um please do come back and clarify if, if you want me to answer something different um Larea says protocols.io has a partnership with plus one protocols are there any other protocol journals with which we've partnership not yet is the um very short answer to that but we would love to have more really integrated partnerships like that with other journals um in the same way that when you've submitted a preprint to bioarchive you can then select from many different journals to publish or submit that paper to for consideration for publication we would love to have the ability with protocols.io to have a selection of different journals where you could go go to uh, with your protocol and method paper for consideration um, but I mean there are many many journals that will be very happy to have you link in your materials and methods they just wouldn't be specific um, necessarily specific uh, methods papers that require the protocols that IO tie in. If any of your editors on journals and you would want to explore that with us, please feel free to drop us a line. Or if you've suggestions of journals that you think might be receptive, drop us a line about that too. We'd be happy to follow up. Um, that is great. And good, I'm glad that was clear previously. And then another question after getting a DOI at protocols.io, what is the best way to get published? <laughs> um, I, you know, it, this is again comes back to the research content that you're working on um, that is published, but not peer reviewed when you have the DOI. So strictly speaking, it is published. It will appear on your ORCID profile. Um, it will show up on Google Scholar. It is not a peer reviewed publication. So you will still need to, if you want a peer reviewed publication, contextualize the link, the protocol, put that DOI into another article and submit to a journal of your choice. So you could go to lab protocols. Obviously, that's a great tie in with protocols.io and it serves the purpose of a location where you can publish a method paper and make use of protocols.io. But um, if you have a different scope or you wanted a different audience, um, you can take it to your journal of choice. I'm not sure there's a best way to get published at that point in time. But um, yeah, it shouldn't preclude you going anywhere if you've made them uh, public on protocols.io. That is great. Um, stop the share. I am happy to sit for another couple of minutes if anyone has more questions. Perhaps I will stop the recording now in case anyone's feeling like they didn't want to ask a question while the recording was happening.